Okay, so this is from Chicago Open, Caro Khan. In case you're not sick of the Caro Khan, this is called the Tardikauer variation. Knight on f6. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Most players take, and my opponent here, his name is Kalman. Uh, he goes by Cal, and he was rated like 2050, and I think he said he was 13 years old. So pretty strong player, young player. He trades on f6. I accept double pawns. Tartikauer is one of my favorite openings in all of chess. I find this pawn structure fascinating, and I think it's really hard to appreciate until you've seen some Tartikauer games. Why black would ever want these double pawns? Because if you took all of the pieces off the board, just left king and pawns, white is very close to winning in almost every position. So in a way, it sort of puts this pressure on the player playing black to play actively. You can't just swap everything off and trade into a lost king and pawn game. So I'm going to fly through a couple moves here. This is sort of our standard Tardikauer setup. So in the Chess Goals Carol Khan course, I recommend this same move order for black in essentially all of the Tardikauer accepted lines. So as soon as white takes here, you're going to do this setup no matter what. And now my opponent trades dark square bishops. So that was technically my good bishop. It was opposite color of these pawns. White's good bishop is sitting here, opposite of these pawns. So white's got the good bishop against my bad bishop, um, even though it is open right now. You know, it's not trapped in completely. This knight, though, is a little bit misplaced. This knight is a bit stronger. So we play a couple more moves. I get this bishop to its optimal square, pointing both directions, and I'm using it sort of like a pawn. Notice how white controls all of these dark squares. My bishop is helping me control light squares. I don't control that one yet. But I'm trying to fight for the center, and I'm also looking to attack king's side. And I'm going to use this double pawn to help me attack king's side. Now, Cal plays bishop takes g6. We get this pawn structure. This is very rare to see in chess. Yes, pawn cube. Exactly right. I get the pawn cube formation. It looks so ugly. And you might be thinking white's just winning here. If you didn't see the eval bar, you might be thinking white is winning here. White's got a knight. That knight can hop all around. They got four versus three on the queen side in terms of the pawns. How does black have any chance in this position? Knight f4. I think he wants to trade that bishop already. So I say no trade. And in a way, this is sort of like an outpost for the bishop. We all know about knight outposts. This could be an outpost for the knight, for example, um, especially if this pawn were already up here, where the knight could not be kicked by a pawn. This is kind of a bishop outpost. Compare this knight to this bishop. They're fighting for a lot of the same squares, right? So white wants to try to eliminate my bishop from having all this control. I want to eliminate the knight from having all of that control that it has, right? They're fighting for the same squares. I would love my bishop back on d5, but right now that knight is not allowing it. I don't want the knight for bishop trade. I don't want to just go into that endgame essentially down a pawn. So here my opponent plays g3. I really like this example for a pawn structure lesson because when white plays g3, what he's trying to do is say, okay, this knight I actually want on e3 because then the bishop on c4 has no good squares. It's going to have to go back and probably play passively. So he's playing g3 as a strategic idea to play knight g2 and knight e3. When I see a move like g3, though, I'm immediately thinking, yes, this is what I need. Look at these light squares. They're open. This gives me chances to play for a win. You know, I think there's chances to play for a win without g3, but especially after seeing a move like g3. 
I can now try to attack the light squares. So in this position, black is up about half a pawn. And there's a couple different good moves for black, but there's one idea that I did find in the game that really proves black has a slight advantage here. Let me know in the chat, what move should black play in this position? It's not the easiest thing to find, but if you've played the Tartikauer or seen some Tartikauer videos, I think you're more likely to spot it. Queen d7, g5, combination, g5. g5, f5, queen g4 is calling my name, <laughs> f5, so queen d7, the idea is to target the light squares, f5, rhuk, you shouldn't retract the funny messages, <laughs> queen d7, b6 and c5, f5, f6. Hey, Jesse's in the chat just in time for the pawn cube. So, oh, that's creative. King h7, rook h8, king g8. That did not even cross my mind, but that's kind of a cool idea. So the answer is pawn to g5. We are using one of our doubled pawns, one of the four pawn cube pawns, and we're pushing to control squares. So thinking back to pawn structure, we now have an equal fight over these two squares, right? Our g pawn attacks both, their g pawn attacks both. These squares are open for the taking, these light squares. So white's king is starting to become vulnerable. And look at our king side structure. These pawns make our king completely safe, and white doesn't have any pieces ready to attack our king. All right, so now after knight g2, I played bishop here. Cal trades rooks and plays rook e1. So this is kind of what you fear as a Tartikauer player. This is what increases your heart rate, gets you a little bit nervous. You don't want to trade off every single piece unless you know you still have some play left in the position. So in this case, rook takes e1 check is actually a good move according to the computer, but it's also fine to avoid the trade. And that's what I did, rook d8. I really wanted to keep a little bit of play on the board, a little bit of additional play by keeping the rooks on. Knight e3. So he's trying to trade off that bishop. I do not want that trade. Bishop e6. I'm still thinking, how do I target these light squares? Now there's a strategic mistake by my opponent. He plays b5. What's the best move for black here? Another quiz for you guys. What is the best move for black? This took the eval from about 0.2 for black to 0.7 for black. Try to figure out what's the best move. Couple C5s, utilizing that pin down the file. Wow, a lot of C5s, okay. C5 is not the strongest move, though. Bishop H3, second best move. Couple C5s again. No one has said it yet. There's one move that stands out. So Bishop H3 is like 0.5 for black. The best move is around 0.7 for black. Yeah, that's right. Ufet says queen to a3. That's correct. Infiltrate with the queen. So every time a pawn moves forward, it creates some potential weaknesses. This position, our queen cannot get in. But I would love to have the queen sitting on a3 anyways, right? If I could somehow sneak that queen in, a3, b3, perfect then we can attack on both flanks. We want to have pressure kingside and pressure queenside at the same time. My opponent plays b5, 
which is a natural looking move. Let's just flip this for a second. You're playing white's position here. You see four versus three on the queen side. You know your king's a little bit exposed. You know you want trades, but your opponent, black, is avoiding all the trades, right? The rooks aren't traded. The miners aren't traded. How do you push as white? The logical looking idea is to expand queen side. He just didn't quite appreciate the downside of pushing this pawn. So let's flip it back. Queen a3, attacking this pawn on a4. He takes on c6. So now I do have this additional isolated pawn. And he plays knight c2. And this is something where I had calculated this out before I played queen a3. So I was pretty proud of this calculation. I looked at this full line before playing queen a3. But essentially, the only way for him to try to defend this pawn is to do this knight c2, rook a1, take on a7 idea. Because if he plays a move like queen c2, I figured I could probably always go bishop b3 and scoop the pawn up that way. So he goes knight c2, I take, rook a1, queen b5, he takes. So we're back to equal. I want you guys in the chat now, type the sequence, the winning sequence for black. So go a couple moves deep. Tell me, how does black win this position? Give me a line. Materials equal. We still have the pawn cube. Two sets of double pawns. White's got the open king, though. Our king is pretty safe. Dennis is saying queen to b2. Not a sequence, he says. <laughs> queen b2 and white resigns. David is saying queen to b1 check. Reg dog, bishop h3, pin the king down. Queen b1, pd, bishop h3, likely to lead to mate. Yeah, you guys are on the right track. Queen b1 check, bishop d5. So the move I played in the game is queen to b1 check. If king to g2 is played, my plan is bishop to d5 check, and if f3, pawn to g4, utilizing this pawn to win the pawn on f3. So that doesn't seem to work for white. The queen cannot block the check because the knight drops. So the logical move is knight to e1, which my opponent plays. Now this is the move that I think is the hardest to find. There's multiple moves that are still winning for black, but there's one move that really just puts the nail in the coffin right here, and it's essentially time to resign for white. What do you guys think? Yep, I'll send a link out into the recording of the session. And actually, if you for sure want a link to this, send me an email, matt at chesscoles.com, to get a, make sure you get a link. Otherwise, you'll see it on the YouTube channel. C5, 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 Queen E4, Bishop H3, delicious. No one has said it yet. Keep trying. No one has said the move yet. Rick to b8. That's not it. Rick b8 is a good move, though. A lot of these moves are good. c5 is a good move. But there's one move that really just says, you're done, white. You're out of moves. Bs. That's correct. Rook to e8. Rook to e8 is the move. And I'll tell you why. If we move this bishop first off of e6, there's a sneaky move for white, rook to e7, which comes back to defend the e1 knight. But by playing rook to e8, there's actually not a good move for white. 
And our threat is simple. We're going to move this bishop and double attack the knight. Like, for example, bishop to h3, and there's nothing white can do. So my opponent played queen to e3, trying to attack my rook. Um, and at this point, there's a couple good moves. You can play king f8, for example. But I thought the one I played was straightforward enough. Bishop to d7, attacks the queen and the knight. He takes, plays his rook here, king f8, and he resigned. So I think this was one of my favorite games in terms of pawn structure. And when I was trying to think what game could I show for this lesson, it immediately popped into my mind. Because if we go back to the start, the whole game was based on pawns. There were no crazy like imbalances in terms of minor pieces or exchange sacrifices. Right? We start with the double pawns here. Then we get to this decision by white to create the pawn cube. Um, this is like a 0.1 advantage for black, so still pretty standard. But then I think the critical moves after that are right here. White plays g3. And this is something that I talked about at my uh, recent lecture at the local chess club. Alpha Zero loves these long term king weaknesses. And I think Alpha Zero has taught a lot of us players to appreciate that in, in our games as well. Seeing a move like g3, even though there's no immediate way to access the light squares and create a checkmate, and it looks like white could probably always defend against it. That's the start of the downfall for white. And then playing this move b5 on 23 allows the queen in. So it's this combination of the king weakness, the queen sneaking in, and then very quickly things go downhill because when you have a long-term king weakness, it can tend to cause problems down the line.